We have to start from the beginning, so to say, for the audience who don't okay. know you, David Icke. Uh, most people know you, but not everyone. And we have to, for starters, we need to uh, talk about what you are associated most with. That is the reptilian um, agenda and that we are divine beings, but we are manipulated from beings that are not from here or what, uh, uh, and that they are actually the royal family, the British royal family is involved with reptilian beings. How does it work? Crikey, on you go. Um, it's uh, something that I've been... Well, researching is, um, is, is a hardly applicable word in some ways, because to research means to look for. And you do do that, of course you do. But after some extraordinary, um, uh, what people would call paranormal experiences in 1990 and 91, um, my life has become since then this synchronistic series of coincidences um, which have led me to, and even brought to me, really, um, people, personal experiences, documents, books, and all these different sources um, that have put information before me in a very coordinated way, like some hidden hand is passing information to you. And it's not just random information, it's information that very clearly, as it comes into my life, has a a direction. It has a um, a series of steps. So, in the early 1990s, the information that was coming into my life was about the fact that there was a a cobal that was manipulating uh, human society and world events towards the goal of a Orwellian global state mm. in which um, there would be a, a world government dictating to every country. Countries would be dismantled and become regions of great power structures. The European Union is a classic. Um, and what we're seeing now with the European Union is the next stage of breaking countries up by destroying them financially and then um, centrally dictating financially and, and in terms of government. Um, and that there was a plan for a global army to impose the will of the world government, uh, a world central bank to impose um, the cabal's um, global financial structure and uh, control, and that the plan was for um, every child at birth to be microchipped as a matter of course. Now that was kind of whoa enough um, as the information came and of course with the passage of the years this has been confirmed more and more by the fact that it's happening. Um, then there was a phase uh, in the mid to late 1990s when while that other information continued and has continued to this present day another if you like parallel and connected series of synchronistic um, the situations happened in my life which brought information to me and this mm -hmm. related to the fact that the network of families which go back to the ancient world that are behind this control system I've just described and, and its ambitions mm -hmm. actually take a non-human form, a, a, a not just reptilian, though that seems to be the dominant one, but and I uh, moved on from that too and gone into other levels a bit beyond that. Uh, but that there is a non-human force um, behind this uh, attempt to lock down the world. And then from about 2002, 2003, right to the present day, all these continue, once they come in, into my life, these different areas, they continue together. That's why I work 12, 15 hours a day, mm. keeping up with it. But this third phase from about 2000, 2003, was the most important. Because without this, you can't really understand the rest. 
And that was about the nature of reality, the illusory nature of what we call physical reality, the fact that solidity is delusional, and that we live in a holographic, illusory physical reality, which is only one level of many multi-levels of this reality, which operates on a waveform uh, uh, level, vibrational level, it operates on an electrical level, it operates on a digital level, and it operates on the holographic level, which we, in the conscious mind, perceive as, as the world. And to appreciate that when I look through my eyes, another illusion, funnily enough, which is why when people have near-death experiences, they leave the body and they're looking down on the body with the eyes, but they're still seeing. Hmm. So, I mean, the, the scale of illusion in our so-called physical experience is, is extraordinary. I mean, and we've not got to the bottom of it yet. But um, it is that when I look through my eyes, shall we say, that um, people think that they're, they're seeing everything there is to see in the space that I'm looking at. They're, no, they're not. They're seeing a tiny band of frequency called visible light which is so tiny, mm -hmm. it is ludicrous. Um, and the rest of uh, what exists in this universe, and even mainstream science would say this, although it's Stone Age science, I would suggest, but even it sees this, that the overwhelming vast majority of what exists in this universe, in energy, matter, mass, whatever you want to call it, is different forms, we cannot see. And therefore... We are living, if you like, in like a, a holographic television channel. Mm -hmm. So, all I'm seeing now as I look here is this tiny frequency range called visible light. Channel, channel one. Yeah, but all the other um, levels of reality also share the same space as the one that we're experiencing. And, you know, we've got digital television coming in now and all that stuff. But um, if you take the analog version of television, uh, radio too, mm. um, they are sharing the same space without interfering with each other but because they're on different frequencies. And thus, interpenetrating this reality that we experience um, with a conscious mind, it are all the other realities where very, very different worlds are manifest and with very different uh, what we call laws of physics. And so it's from these frequencies that are very, very close to this one uh, that we use the term with radio and television um, where interference takes place. Um, and if you have two radio stations that are well away from each other in the frequency band, then they don't interfere with each other. You, one's not aware of the other one. But you get two frequencies that are, are, are close, and you can get, you might, it might be dominated by one, but there's interference from the other. Why? Because the frequencies are very close. Well, these um, manipulating entities, forces, shall we say, um, operate from a frequency band that's very close to this one, but not this one. So, but they might not see them, that, but, but they might yeah. be here. Well, let, let, let's give an example. You'll see stories um, of UFOs appearing out of nowhere and disappearing into nowhere. You'll hear stories about uh, people saying, this entity appeared out of nowhere and disappeared into nowhere. Well, they haven't disappeared. Mm -hmm. well, uh, and they haven't appeared out of nowhere. What they've done is they've entered the frequency band that we can decode, um, the, the visible light frequency band that I'm talking about, and when it enters that, we start decoding that information because it's now in our ability to do that. And as we start decoding it, bang, to the, to the observer, it appears that it's just come out of nowhere. And then it leaves that frequency range, and to the observer, it's disappeared into no, it hasn't. It's just left that band that we can decode, which is tiny. And so, when you... And I find this particularly compelling, 
um, when I go around different ancient beliefs and explanations of what's happening, and you find that although they're using different names, they're telling the same story. Mm. Uh, for instance, um, there was a, a group of people, or a, a, shall we say a belief system, which goes back hundreds of years and has become known as Gnostic. This was the belief system of people that ran the, the, the great library of Alexandria um, with uh, Hypatia, who was slaughtered by a mob inspired by the Roman church because um, that library carried information and knowledge that would have, as it circulated, um, demolished the Roman church's version of everything. And um, it was challenging the Roman church version of everything. And what's interesting is whenever you come across the Gnostics belief system expressing itself, um, you you see it's followed by slaughter, suppression, and the destruction of that knowledge. Hmm. So um, the Cathars in southern France um, were Gnostics in terms of their belief system. Um, we'll go into what that belief system is in a second. Uh, and so, again, in went the church, and uh, all these you know, people that kill for the church, and they destroyed the Cathars. It's, I think, uh, 1244, was it, was the, the, the last stand to the, the mountain fortress at Montségur in southern France in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, and again, it's not just we slaughter, we slaughter them, but we destroy their knowledge. But, but a, a fantastic thing happened in 1945 when um, a sealed jar of Gnostic writings, quite considerable writings, was found um, by a peasant in Egypt in 1945. And they describe much of the Gnostic belief system. Now, key in my interest, one of the things, of course, as a quick aside, they were telling a very different version of the Christian story. Um, and um, we might get into that because it, it's relevant. But the, the key thing for me was that around a fifth of these texts were about a phenomenon they called the Archons. And the Archons, um, these Gnostics said, were a manipulative force that operated outside of human sight that was basically, as we would call it, an, a, 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 an energetic form rather than what we would call a physical form, though it could manifest as physical form through holographic projections and stuff. They even, and, and these writings even talked in their own way about the illusory nature of this reality. Um, and they talked about the, the archons were the, uh, if you like, the like cyborg, we would call it, mm -hmm. troops mm -hmm. of something they call the Demiurge. Mm -hmm. And the Demiurge is what Christians call the devil and, and this negative force. And what uh, these writings said is that this reality that we're experiencing was not created by some divine force. It was created by the Demiurge and the Archons, and it was a fake reality. And that they manipulated by accessing the human psyche and manipulating humans' perception of reality. And there was very, some very, very interesting things that they said about the Archons. And one was that they lacked the ability to express the creative force. I would put it like this. If you gave them a blank sheet of paper and said create something like a reality, they couldn't do it. Mm. But what um, the Gnostic writings say is they're experts at taking something that already exists, like the reality before this uh, hijack, as I would call it, the one we experience now, 
and twist it. Mm -hmm. They piggyback something already created and twist it. Something else they said the archons did. And you know, you're going back to something that's been estimated, I think around 400 AD, these writings were buried. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that the archons parasite off everything. They parasite off human um, society in many, many different forms. And I read this stuff and, and I'm going, whoa, this is my own uh, books over the years um, found in a jar <laughs> in Egypt. Right. Um, not all the detail of my books, but the basic themes, because it fitted totally. And then you go to the Islamic belief. And not just the Islamic belief, because this, this came from pre-Islamic Arabia originally. And that is the, the very considerable focus in Islam on energetic beings they call the jinn. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the jinn and you look at what the Gnostics said about the archons, hallelujah, hello, they're the same thing. And then you go around other cultures and you see the same recurring theme. And um, so when you look then at human society, um, who creates, what is the creative force within human society? Humans. Should be. Mm -hmm. What do the... Um, what do these families that I've been exposing all these years, what do they do? They piggyback off that creative force and manipulate it and direct it in a way that suits them. What do these network of families also do? They parasite off human effort, human labor, human energy, human creativity, the banking system, I rest my case. What is the global banking system except a Parasite. structure um, totally uh, focused on parasiting the energy uh, and off the efforts of the human population? What is taxation in the way that it is today? It is parasiting of human efforts and human creativity. So. What I also found interesting is that the archons are, are described, as, as we would say, like cyborgs. They're almost like they're computer-like, mm -hmm. and they serve this, this force they call the demiurge. Well, I've been talking about these reptilian entities that operate outside human sight but can come in, and, mm -hmm. and the archons can but they can't stay for long because of the, the frequency difference. They can come in for a while, but it takes so much energy to, to stay in our reality because it's not their natural frequency band that they, mm. they can't stay for long. And what they've done, just as a quick aside before I continue that thing about the reptilians, what they've done is they have created a network of bloodline families going way back to the ancient world which represent their interests with invisible light because they can't come here and stay for very long. So these families, where their outer human form, if you like, is operating within the frequency band of visible light, mm. they are the archon representatives within human society. And this is why you get this network of um, families that sit on top of the banking system, the transnational corporation network, uh, the media ownership level, uh, top of science, top of the education uh, system, top of the military, top of the in in global intelligence network. These are these families representing what the Gnostics call the Archons. And I was just going to say a few minutes ago, um, when you look at how these Archons are described, they're just like the reptilians that I've been writing about for years in terms of their um, computer-like um, 
structured to the point of obsession uh, society which absolutely knows its hierarchical place every level knows its hierarchical place in it and it's very um, robot-like and computer-like uh, it's not a flowing creative force it's very structured boom boom and that's how the archons are described and they have it, no it, compassion it, no yes yes I mean, empathy I, 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 the only one time I've taken psychoactive drugs in my life it was in 2003 in a rainforest in Brazil when I took a, a rainforest potion called ayahuasca and I went into I, I had an amazing time some people had a bad time on it and mm. for five hours this voice so strong when I went into an altered state of um, perception talked to me so loud loudly and so powerful about the illusory nature of reality for five hours and when I came back and because I had instant memory of all of it uh, when I came back and uh, checked it all out you could see very quickly that mainstream science in all its different disciplines has, has, has shown that what I was told that night is true but because the disciplines are kept apart and are, are, are mm. war with each other for funding and, 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 and precedence that the, the, the dots never get put together because they're not mm. meant to they, we're not supposed to know what reality we are experiencing it gives us too much power once we know um, and this voice said to me at one point about when he's talking about the computer like nature of these manipulators if you programmed a computer to abuse a child would the, would the computer have any problem with it no why because it would just um, decode the data and act in line with the data the software program and these uh, this reptilian force um, is very much like that very uh, structured very predictable and interestingly um, because most people don't realize this but one of the most important parts of the human brain in terms of human behavior and response and reaction to situations is called the reptilian brain or the R complex mm. and when you look at the traits of the reptilian brain within the human brain of course other parts of the brain are balanced that out or should do but when you have more reptilian genetics those traits of the reptilian brain are obviously more extreme and more more pronounced and one of the the this is mainstream science um, one of the key traits of the reptilian brain is obsessive ritualistic behavior mm -hmm. and what is ritualistic behavior it's following the same pattern um, you know day after day week after week repeating repetitious behavior now this is robotic uh, and, and so you've got the uh, the reptilians described in that, those terms the archons described in those terms etc and these forces are, are different uh, expressions and names for the same thing now one of the manifestations of this network of bloodlines that represent this archonic reptilian force within human society uh, is the royal f families going back to the ancient world and the aristocratic families that, that, that surround them why? because where did the idea that certain bloodlines should be king or queen of a, of a, of a, of a people uh, and you have these, this hierarchy because this is the thing, other thing about reptilian genetics and the reptilian mm. brain, it's obsessed with hierarchical structures and power. Look at our world. Mm. Look at the royal families and the aristocracy. It's absolutely rigid with hierarchy. Everyone knows their place. You're a viscount, you're a baron, you're a lord, you're a king, you're a prince, and all this stuff. Yep. This is the human expression 
uh, or the partly human expression because they're hybrids um, of the uh, reptilian archon obsession with hierarchical structure manifested in our world because what they've done it, they're doing is bringing that arconic reptilian reality into our world and making our world like theirs more and more and more now we have this thing of course going way back which goes under the title of things like the divine right to rule and what is that that's the right to rule because of your bloodline because of your dna and we have the ancient emperors of um, china claiming the right to be the ruler because of their uh, descendants from the serpent gods <laughs> and the, the, the association between the serpent and the snake with royalty and royal families and royal bloodlines just follow it back and so um, you look at these royal bloodlines that have come through because what happened is that uh, there came a time when the human population started to reject overt, in your face, dictatorship from royal bloodline. And that you had that move where this force, not entirely, not least in Britain, um, moved um, into what I call the dark suit professions of banking and business and, and all the rest of it, and, and, and politics, and, and have gone on manipulating from, from that point of view. But some of them survived, like the British royal family. Now, if you want to see a group of people that are so obsessed to the extreme, not just with hierarchy, but my goodness me, they are. The whole British class system, as they call it, is based on, obviously, hierarchy, which is based on the head of state being the queen. But you want to see a group of people who are obsessed with ritualistic behavior, look at the royal family. Mm. She goes to the same palace, uh, at Christmas. She goes to the same palace uh, um, in um, the summer. She goes uh, to the same palace in the spring and so on. And, and, you, and if you look at um, the royal year, it's ritualistic. It's a hamster's wheel, repeating, repeating, repeating. And then, and we've seen in the week that we're talking, um, 60 years, the Queen 60th, Elizabeth, yes. uh, yeah, uh, Animals, year which... on the throne, the, the Diamond Jubilee. Mm. It's really been in our face in the last few days, and I've watched as much as I can because I wanted to follow the ritual. But, you know, Britain is famous for what is called pomp and ceremony. Mm. You know, the, the, the guards in red jackets and black hats, you know, like, you know, need a haircut, <laughs> um, uh, marching up changing of the guard and then you've got people in breaches and, and, and all this stuff it's unbelievable but it's not pomp and ceremony it is ritual, ritual. repeating ritual so if you know I'm saying and I've said for years and years and years I've been saying it this week um, mm. as this has unfolded that the British royal family and the royal families of Europe too but the British royal family is a an expression of this hybrid bloodline which represents these other dimensional forces within human society and I've described how these other dimensional forces operate their mentality how they stress structured and you look at the British royal family alone and it's absolutely a mirror of the very traits that the Gnostics etc of spoken of in terms of this uh, arconic other dimensional force so you know it's very challenging obviously for people that have not researched this and and not been through the experiences that I've been through in terms of things that I've seen and things that I've experienced and things that I've, I've, I've read and researched and also because from cradle to grave, we are given a certain version of reality. Boom! Mm. You know, education system, peer pressure, media, all the way through to actually go, 
and encompass the possibility of what I'm saying. But you know, it's like Gandhi said, even if you're in a minority of one, and I'm not anymore, far from it, mm. but even if you're in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. And it's not, it doesn't become an untruth because people can't find the capacity to see it's possible. It's just, you know, people say, um, that's impossible, uh, that can't be done, that's crazy. But what are they doing? They're just looking at something from a certain point of observation. And if their point of observation has been just to take in the programming that's imposed upon us from the first moment we become conscious in this reality, then they'll see it in a certain way and they'll say, that's crazy. But if you spend 22 years researching it, you're looking at it from a completely different point of observation, and to you, it's blatantly bloody obvious. Uh, and it's bringing those two points of view together that's the challenge, because what is happening in the world, and, and, and what's behind what is happening in the world, is so massively different, fundamentally almost indescribably different, to what we're told is happening, that that's the chasm that is probably more than anything else the greatest defense uh, vehicle that this conspiracy has. It is so extraordinary that people think it's not possible and anyone that talks about it must be crazy. But it is changing. All right. On the other hand, I just uh, wanted to ask that uh, people waking up and uh, people are coming to your lectures now to the thousands, thousands and you have full halls and you want to do a big uh, event in the Wembley um, arena with, with probably thousands of uh, people. Um, so it's important if you know all these things that they are pretty frightening, that we are being manipulated for thousands of years. How do, on the other hand, we are divine consciousness, you said, and uh, we, we we just have to change our perception. What can we do now that we know that we are being manipulated? How do we get out of it and can we get out of it? Well, you have to go deep in the rabbit hole for this. And of course, you're constantly going deeper or trying to go deeper. Um, but, see, there are many aspects to this. When, um, again, you scan the ancient world, including texts that came through to be things like Genesis and the Bible. There is another common thing, and that is that there was an interbreeding, I'm sure it was direct interbreeding, but interbreeding, there was, a, there was genetic manipulation mm. of the human form. And this is my view after 22 years of researching this and the information coming to me. Before this force hijacked our reality, humans were very different. And it's so different, I won't call them humans, I'll call them Earth people. Mm -hmm. um, and they were a heart censored society in the sense that, you know, we have this holographic body and interpenetrating all the different levels of the human form, energetic and holographic, are vortexes that have become known as chakras, uh, wheels of light, uh, as they call them in Asia. Vortexes which interpenetrate these different energy fields. And it seems there are seven basic ones, of foundation ones, many others, but foundation ones, going up through the, the human form, and, and this one is the key, hmm. the heart. This vortex connects us to way out there, to far higher, more expanded levels of awareness um, than any, anything else. And uh, the Organization, there's an organization in America, it's called the Institute of Heart Math. 
and they uh, research the power of the heart. Heart maths. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. And <laughs> they, they have, they've been doing it for a long time now, they have found that the most powerful electromagnetic field in the body field of electromagnetic fields is the heart. There are more nerves going from the heart to the brain than coming the other way. Mm -hmm. And that when the heart um, energetic field is in what they call coherence, in other words, balance, and connects in coherence with the central nervous system and the brain, that trinity, if you like, when it comes into harmony, takes some, the person into a much higher level of awareness and consciousness. Mm -hmm. The key is the coherence of the heart field. Once you knock that out, you knock everything out, and what's left then as the arbiter and decider of reality. This. Now this is a great servant to this. Mm -hmm. It's not a great master when it's in control of our perception of reality. And there's another vortex in the belly which is about emotions. It's, this is why when people feel nervous or frightened they feel they feel it in the belly. Um, oh, and, and you know they need to go to the toilet. It's because the imbalance caused by the fear and nervousness in the in the chakra, the vortex, linked to emotions, um, is affecting the balance or imbalancing in the same way the the intestinal system and and what have you. Um, and what they've done to pull humanity into a low vibrational brain dominated perception is they've moved the point where we interact with reality from the heart to the belly. Hmm. They've done it genetically because as I said in my last book, remember who you are, I'm saying that on the level of human DNA that they call junk DNA, which is anything up to 98% non-coding DNA, um, they call it junk DNA because they don't know what it does. Well, some cutting edge scientists, not least in, uh, in Russia and, and some in America, uh, are pointing out that actually within so-called junk or non-coding DNA is a language and it's a very... Um, uh, it's a language that you can you can see and you can uh, uncover, and it operates very much like human language. It has m many of the very closely the traits of how human language is sequenced. This is how this language, as they call it, within so-called junk DNA, is sequenced. And they're talking about the fact that the human language, which is what vibrational fields that's what it is we hear the words but only when the brain decodes them mm -hmm. what's passing between me and you now is not the words and what people are hearing what's passing between me and everybody is not words it's a vibrational information field generated by my vocal cords mm -hmm. people are only hearing the words when they decode that information so everything is vibrational waveform at its base even language DNA is waveform, like the body is waveform in its base, in its base uh, state. And they're starting to uncover this language and it fits absolutely my contention that part of this genetic manipulation was to put into junk DNA what I call biological software programs and they are basically perception programs so if you put a disk into a computer and the computer starts to read it on the screen the computer's symbolic perception hmm. is read from the disk well what if we had biological software programs running through from junk DNA this language they find they're finding 
And we were reading them into a perception of reality. The other key side of this is that there are emotional biological software programs in there that are running all the time. And when you uh, are reading those, then you are in the belly because they're, 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 they're low vibrational software programs in terms of emotions because they're all about fear and all the subdivisions of fear like anxiety and frustration and, and, and depression and uh, guilt, all these expressions, different expressions of fear. Um, and if, you do, if we do not open our minds, I call this the human body-mind computer, biological computer, if we don't open our minds and let the true self in, consciousness, then humans are operating literally in a closed system in which the DNA emotional and perception programs are running and not being challenged by a, a level of awareness that is beyond the program. So basically, people talk about the blind leading the blind. Mm. What humans are is the program leading the program. Mm -hmm. And it is my view, and this, this may be shocking to people, um, even some have been along this road a bit, it's my view after 22 years of putting this together that the vast majority at least of humans have been going through entire lifetimes without having a single original thought or emotional response. Now when you've got psychologists, I mean Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist talked about this, but others too. When you've got psychologists that say that they can break down the human personality into 12 major archetypes and combinations of them, well, at the level of awareness, at the level of consciousness, at the level of the true self, we are infinite possibility within an infinite reality of infinite possibility. How on earth can you break down that into 12 major archetypes and combinations of them. It's ludicrous. You can't. But what can you do that to? Computer programs. Hmm. And that's what, that's what, that's what we are. This, these archetypal personalities are actually software running, perception software, running within junk DNA. Now, put all this together, and that has moved us from a heart centered society, connected out into a greater level of reality. This is the innate intelligence. This is supposed to serve this, not be the governor of perception. That's why this knows and this thinks has to work it out. People don't go, um, my intuition thinks, no. My intuition, and we do this, don't we? My intuition just knows, knows. Because instinctively, on a subconscious level, we're going to that point of true um, knowledge, true awareness, not beyond knowledge, this is knowledge awareness. Um, but what's happened is it's, our point of interacting has gone from the heart-centered society, and if you're coming from this, and this innate awareness, this innate knowing, this innate understanding that everything is connected to everything else, then you create, manifest from that, a completely different society to the one that we have. What's the one that we have? <coughs> They've moved it into the belly. Humans now, <coughs> gold. <coughs> I've got a cough. <laughs> It's not the cough that carries you off, it's the coffin that carries you off. In. <laughs> now, they've moved it into a belly society. Where does human response come from, overwhelmingly, to events that we face? The emotions. It's an emotional response, it's an emotional reaction. It's not a heart reaction, overwhelmingly, though of course it does happen. It's, a, it's an emotional reaction. You know, this 
uh, mass manipulation technique that I called a long time ago problem reaction solution where they create the problem covertly tell the people through an unquestioning mainstream media the version of the problem they want people to believe <laughs> and then they get the reaction from the people do something do something something must be done and then they who have covertly created the problem got that reaction do something then at stage three openly offer the solution to the problems um, that they have created which gives them the excuse to change society and advance the agenda that that, that they're following now it's not problem go into the heart look at it from the innate intelligence of the heart it's not even problem have a think about it do a bit of research see what you think mm -hmm. it's problem reaction mm -hmm. solution it's the manipulation of an emotional response an emotional reaction and and what they're doing all the time is manipulating uh, an emotional response to get support or to justify what they're doing. Um, so, for instance, they'll um, they'll tell you that uh, Gaddafi was killing his own people and and what have you, because they're looking for an emotional response. Oh no, we've got to stop him killing his own people. What they don't tell you, of course, is that the rebels were actually put in there, funded and armed by, by the NATO alliance hmm. to cause the problem. And then when Gaddafi's troops start reacting to what they're doing, um, uh, shooting back at being shot at, then suddenly, oh, look, Gaddafi's hmm. killing his own people. Reaction, oh, oh yeah, we've got to stop it. So this is happening all the time. You know, 9-11, ooh, that was, what, look at 9-11. And those horrific pictures and, and, and the towers coming down. Did that, did that take us to here? No, it took people here. And from this gut, what were you saying? Gut reaction. You know how many what, you know, how you, people say, what does your heart tell you? What does your heart tell you? Right? But how many times, instead of going, what does your heart tell you? What do we say? What does your gut tell you? Mm -hmm. Emotional response, emotional reaction. And so what they've done is moved us, not all of us, not everybody, but, you know, the vast majority, they've yeah. moved them from their heart, high vibration, which they can't touch. Yeah. If we're in the heart, we're untouchable. It's like Radio 1 trying to impact on Radio 2. Can't be done. They're terrified of us going into the heart uh, because it's over. Um, so they move us into their stadium vibrationally. Because not only do they manipulate human response through um, emotion, they feed off human low vibrational emotional energy. They've turned us into their energy source. Because they're an energetic source, basically, at, that, at their core. Well, we all are, but they're much uh, more energetic than we are. Because we, we're, we're much more aware of the holographic, the so-called physical. Um, and so when we, when we eat food, we think we're eating physical food. There is no physical. We're eating holographic food. But the foundation of that food, which we decode into some kind of illusory solidity, is actually a waveform information field. All that these entities do is they feed, they, they get their energy source, not from a sandwich and a cup of tea, but directly, energetically, they absorb energy in its uh, waveform. And so when we generate low vibrational human emotion, that emotion is resonating within the frequency. That's why we can't see it. We can feel emotion, but we can't see it. Um, because it's vibrating within another frequency band beyond visible light. And that's the frequency band that these archons, reptilians, um, overwhelmingly operate in. So every time we generate fear and all its offshoots, we're feeding them energetically. So you get a, a war, a 9-11, a global war, and it's uh, you get an economic crisis where parents now in Greece are giving their children away or selling their children because they can't afford to feed them 
Can you imagine in that one incident with one uh, set of parents how much is generated here emotionally from the horrific, I can't even think about it, imagine what it must be like. Um, and that's just two parents. You get that operating. Look at the world. Look at the world every day. All over the world. In all these different expressions. How emotional energy is being generated and, 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 and produced by the circumstances that society has been structured to create. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an orgy of energetic vampiring. And so, when Morpheus in the Matrix held up a battery and said, the Matrix is a computer-generated dream world made to turn humans into one of these, that is a profound truth. Because that's what we've become. Not so much batteries, though that was a good symbol, mm -hmm. but actually generators, power stations, generating this energy. So we have this situation, if we bring these strands together at this point, in, in my contention, that these perception programs are running through junk DNA, and the emotional software programs, biological software programs, are running through uh, non-coding junk DNA. And as those programs uh, are running, and as society is structured so that it generates situations, in computer terms, data, that trigger those programs and bring them to the surface where they're more uh, impacting upon our behavior and responses. Um, you are A, locking humanity into this closed system where the program programs the program, and you're also pulling people from the heart, high vibration, down into low vibrational belly uh, emotional vortex, which is pulling humanity into the predator's vibrational stadium. And in doing so, they are able to trawl and vampire the energy that that emotional state and response is constantly generating. Now, I've talked for a long time from your question, what can we do? Because that background, I suggest, was fundamentally necessary. So what do we do? What can we do? It might sound straight, uh, trite and, 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 and all the rest of it. I mean, because what we've got to do, of course, is we've got to stockpile weapons. Um, we've got to um, create uh, human armies to fight against them. And we've uh, basically got to try to do all the things to them that they do to us, right? And where does that take us? First of all, it makes us them. And secondly, if we go down that road... A will do what? Will produce more and more and more of this low vibrational emotional energy um, in the in the in the hatred and in the um, uh, the anger that we produce. And we will also, if we go down that road, um, we will have symbolically um, weapons that manifest as a pop gun against state-of-the-art weaponry so although it's very macho and very we've got to fight I love Tony Blair once he said we've got to fight for peace <laughs> sorry can I just have some time to work that out in a darkened room please um, and it's it is something that, when you look at it, is very good for the, the matcha we've got to fight in. But as a strategy of bringing this down, it is doomed to failure and disaster. Because it's playing the game they want us to play. And if you're in that matcha mode, and you think the whole spiritual side of things and stuff like that is namby-pamby, airy-fairy and a bit, you know, soft. Then what I'm going to say 
will make no sense. But if we are going to bring an end to something that has been created and perpetuated by something happening, then we can fight that something or we can remove that something. And if you've got your finger in, um, you know, a boiling pan of water, well, you can, uh, you can turn the gas off or you can, you can literally take your finger out. In other words, instead of finding a solution to the problem, turning the gas off, not really a solution, your finger's still in there, you remove the cause of the problem. The cause of your problem burning in the water is because your finger's in the frickin' water. So remove it. Done. And if you look at any situation that we want to change, you will always find that removing what has caused the problem is always far more effective than finding a solution to the problem that you've caused. And so, we have this control system, we have this constant and gathering, expanding imposition and dismantling of people's lives financially in all these different ways. And we can say the solution is to fight the system and get out on the streets and fight and, and all this stuff. Or we can say, what has caused this reality that we are experiencing? So why not remo uh, remove the cause of the problem? And this is not about fighting. It's not about macho man responses. It's not about shouting loud. It's about changing the way that we interact with reality. And in doing so, stepping out of the influence of the programs that have been running human perception and emotional response throughout known human history and are creating the world that we live in. Because if I go back to what the Gnostics said about the Archons, they have no creative energy. They can't make things happen. But we can. We can, yes. Which is bringing us to an interesting point. We can manifest. What this manipulative force has done is program humans to use that gift of manifestation to manifest what they want. And so, if we manifest from our perceptions of reality, then manipulate their perception of reality and they'll manifest what you've manipulated them to perceive as reality. So, I see people challenging war and conflict when their own lives are full of conflict. Now, we live in a holographic reality at this conscious mind level. And there's a very unique and fascinating trait that, and characteristic of holograms and holographic reality. Every part of the whole is a smaller version of the whole. So if you take, for instance, in the holograms that you buy in the shops, if you take the waveform holographic print, which is on the print in waveform information, and you cut it in four, and you fire the laser, which brings the, reads that information in effect, and brings the three-dimensional holographic image projecting from the waveform information 
on the photographic print. If you cut that into four and put a laser to the each four pieces, you will not get a quarter of the whole picture. You'll get four quarter size versions of the whole picture. And this is why, uh, or explains, why alternative forms of healing like um, reflexology and acupuncture and others can find points on the ear and the feet and the hands and all different parts of the body that relate to the body as a whole. Thus reflexologists can um, work on a part of the foot and impact upon the heart or the liver depending on where they're doing it. And, and I know, I've known and talked to reflexologists and people like that over the years and they know it works but they're not sure why it works or why there are points on the foot and the ear and everything that relate and impact upon the body as a whole. Well, it's so simple when you realize that, the, that this reality is holographic because every part of the whole um, is a smaller version of the whole. The body is a holographic uh, uh, manifestation, it's a hologram. Thus, every part of the body must be a smaller version of the whole. And that's why all over the body, in all the different parts, you can find points that relate to the whole body. In the same way, if we have conflict in our own lives on a so-called individual level, and this is going on all over the world in all these different societies, I mean, and it is, um, then that's a smaller version of the whole. And a hologram moves both ways. When the whole hologram shifts, all the parts of the hologram shift, because they're expressions of each other. You shift or affect the smaller part of the hologram, and in this case it's lots of people, billions of people with conflict in their lives and all that stuff, and that's going to impact on the hologram as a whole, i.e. human society. And you're going to have collective conflict. If we want to put the fire out of the whole, what we call human society and global experience, then we have to put the fire out in our own lives because we are fueling the fire. We are creating the fire. This is why they want conflict and disruption uh, at all levels of society because they know that they're constantly impacting upon each other. We have conflict in our own lives collectively. We are manifesting collective conflict. You have collective conflict like bombing uh, uh, Libya and, 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 and Iraq and what have you and the global conflicts. Those collective conflicts then impact on the individual that, that, that uh, reacts to them uh, with a lot more emotional belly based um, emotion, uh, emotional response. So, so everything is connected to everything else. Everything's impacting on everything else. Now, those behind this manipulation of human society, they know that. And they have been playing humans like a violin for so long. And this is why, not the only reason, not the only reason, but this is why they created human religions in, in this part of why, because there were many whys for that, and why they created uh, human science, which, which is, I call it Stone Age science, it's song sheet science, it's, it's not science, it's just a, a, a bogus explanation for reality, so we don't see the real one. This is why the nature of reality is, is hardly, if any, any time, discussed in schools or, 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 or education in general. Um, and, and, you know, I travel around the world. I've been in 50-odd countries, uh, many of them many times. I've seen the streams of television channels, not least places like America. You're going through the zapper button, and there's channels after channels after channels. I have never seen one that was asking the question with an open mind, who are we, where are we, what is reality? Now that is ludicrous. I mean, 
we have a situation where probably the vast majority of people go through a lifetime, until they come to the end of their lives and they're thinking, you know, where do you go? Who don't even think about who am I? You know, you say to them, who are you? Oh, I'm Charlie Jones. I drive a bus. And they'll tell you your fa family history, they'll tell you their life history and, 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 and all that stuff. That's not them, that's their experience. Um, and, and human self-identity identifies who we are, self, with our experience, with our name, with our job. Um, who are you? I, 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 I'm a banker. No, that's your experience, it's not who you are. And so, um, when you um, lose touch with who you are, and you lose connection to the true self beyond the, the program, then what's left is for the program to run and dominate our sense of reality. Our sense of reality becomes our point of observation by which we judge everything, and the emotional reaction from which our judgment and response to events comes. And it's a closed, ever um, repeating cycle. And uh, unless we break it, then this will go on. And we break it by moving our point of attention, the point at which we interact with the world from there to here. And, you know, I had some amazing experiences in Peru um, in 1991. Amazing experiences which changed my life and all the rest of it. And I went back to Peru with a, a group of people from all over the world in April 2012. And we went around Peru. And we went to Machu Picchu and this place where I had my amazing paranormal, what extraordinary experience in 1991 called Siustani near a place called Puno and Lake Titicaca, the highest number of lake in the world. And this group, all of us, were going around these places. And what these places were, were heart places. Mm -hmm. When you went there, you interacted with them from here. And the behavior of the group and the demeanor of the group was laughter and joy and, and, and happiness. Then there was one day, and this really, you know, I've been aware of all this for a long time, but so, you, know, you know what it's like. Sometimes you have an experience and it goes bang mm. in your face. And there was one day towards the end of the trip well, we went to a place called Kiwaneku, just over the border in Bolivia. It's an ancient site, very famous ancient site. If you look at the, the history and accounts of, um, of South America. And if anyone thinks that human awareness, human emotion, human demeanor does not impact upon the energy field that we're all interacting with. They should cross the border between Peru and Bolivia at this place where we did. You walked across a, mm. a, a bridge across a river and mm. one side was Peru and the other side was <laughs> Bolivia. So once you cross into Bolivia, whoo, doom, ah, this. You're right? back. So <laughs> it took ages to get through the, um, the border guards. Um, just for a tourist group who's going to be in the country for about three hours. They'd all just come back from a, a hospital, apparently, where they'd had a, a sense of humour bypass. <laughs> and, and, um, and we headed to this Kiwanaku, going through, in a 40-minute drive, through um, a police checkpoint and a military checkpoint. You know, I mean, if anyone, if anyone says that he's predicting that... Um, Bolivia is going to be a police state. Well, you're too late, mate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we get there. And it was horrible, Kiwanaku. It was big time here, right? And um, I felt this in many places around the world, and they've all been connected to human sacrifice and rituals involving these entities operating in other, other levels of reality, but interacting with this one. This is what satanic rituals are. Um, they're the interactions. This is why they do certain things and repeat them. They're creating an energetic environment 
which allows interaction and, and even the manifestation of these entities within the rituals. This is what sacrificing to the gods was all about in the ancient world. Um, because when um, you sacrifice someone, the, the people doing the sacrifice, they drink the blood and eat the flesh, which is what this old Christ, uh, Roman Catholic thing is really about. <laughs> Drinking the blood of Jesus and eating the flesh, that's just a mild bloody cover for what goes on in the background. Right. But on the other levels of reality, while this is going on, these entities perceived as the gods are feeding off the terror of the victim. Right? This, this is a sacrifice to the gods. Anyway, we get to Kiwanaku, and it was that kind of energy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But what I noticed was the demeanor of the group changed. Hmm. People weren't happy. They, um, they were not in a good space. And there was this lovely guy, um, Mark, who was a lovely Irish guy. And um, the, the, the change in the behavior of the group was so pronounced that on the way back, which we got back into Peru, where everyone started getting a bit happy again, um, <laughs> I asked people if they wanted to go on the microphone or the bus and explain, you know, their experience. And Mark um, said, and Mark was a lovely, lovely guy, all laughing and dancing and all the rest of it, all the way through Peru. And he said, when I was at Kiwanaku, he said, I just wanted to shout abuse at anyone that got in my way when I was trying to take a picture. And, and I, you know, I just felt so different. And I won't labor the point, but having, you know, seen it, and experienced it and seeing the re response you could see Peru what a world that would be and then Kiwanaku the world that we have today and we really got to move to here and I would say to people it's a challenge in this world because everything virtually everything in this world is designed to push you here hmm. so when you when you're responding from from a uh, a belly emotional point of view just and you can do it with your mind with your consciousness you just move it, and it's not it's moving your point of attention that's what it is you move your point of attention and you you move it here and and so, and, and feel that point of attention here not here and you'll see the situation you face. I know because I've done it myself and I've um, talked to others about doing it and they have and they say, yes, it does work. You get to bring it to here. A situation that you're facing looks very different here to here and vice versa. This is what we need to go. We need to become the heart-centered society that we are being hijacked and manipulated out of. Now, it's not just about moving your point of attention here and, and, and seeing the situation from here. Once you move your point of attention here, the vortex opens. Because now you're interacting with it, with your own awareness, instead of interacting in a way that's dominated by this emotion. And when that opens, what comes through that energetic channel is innate intelligence, innate insight, innate knowing. And suddenly you're seeing the world and getting insights into things and you're seeing what is happening as it is and not as this is programmed to see it. And this is programmed to see it. You see, the, the, the brain isolated from the heart works in unison with the emotional chakra and these two in unison crikey they're a bloody nightmare look at everything about human society that you don't like these two buggers working in unison are where it comes from so this there. see this i'm talking about these emotional and perception programs that I say are running through junk DNA. Once the heart is no longer impacting in any way significantly on our sense of uh, perception, on our sense of reality and all the rest of it, our sense of response, then the brain becomes the governor of our what? Perception, which is dictated to the brain once this is out of the way, which, which can override those bloody programs running through junk DNA, piece of cake, you know, this is where the power is. This is what they're terrified of. 
Um, so once that's closed down, this is what's done by the program of the way society is structured, then um, this becomes the governor of perception. And what it is doing, it is um, decoding as a sense of perception the perception programs running through junk DNA. And that perception uh, of something becomes an emotional response to something, and this is an emotional response from the programs running through junk DNA of the, of, of the emotional programs. So here's your, your, if you like, your holographic manifestation of the um, perception programs of self and the world and reality running through, and here is your holographic expression in, in, in response and reaction of the, of the emotional programs running through junk DNA. And these have created the world we don't like. They've created the ability of the few to dictate to the vast majority. Because this will never see it. This will never get it. Uh, except up to a point. This um, can get to a point where it can see the names, dates, places, um, Bilderberg group level of engineered wars level of what's going on in the world. But seeing where that is coming from, what's behind it, you've got to go into here. Because if you don't, you can't get into the rabbit hole. Because this can only go so far. And it's my view, and uh, in my experience anyway, that if you are an expert in 9-11 in engineered wars, engineered banking scams, manipulated political nonsense, then you are still walking around the outer rim of the rabbit hole. You've not even entered it yet. Because it's still the movie. This holographic reality is like a holographic movie. And when a movie has hit the screen, that's it. It's a done deal. You're going to change the movie now. And that's what this world is, this holographic world. Um, because what the human body computer is doing is taking vibrational waveform information, which is what the five senses do, it's turning into electrical information, same information, different form, and it communicates that to the brain and the whole genetic structure, in fact, and that decodes it through into the, um, the digital and then the holographic. So the holographic, this apparently physical world, is the end of the story. That, in movie terms, is the movie hitting the screen. You ain't going to change it. You won't stand up in front of a movie screen and start shouting at the screen and telling the movie to change, will it? You? You'll go, people will go, you're mad, mate, you're mad. <laughs> you want to change the movie, you've got to change the real. It's being projected from back here. Hmm. Um, and, but that's what we're doing. You know, in so many ways that people respond to this conspiracy when they meet it at some level. It's, we must get out in the streets and protest. Well, I'm not saying don't. But that's still trying to change the movie when the movie's hit the screen. If you come back and go deeper in the rabbit hole and you understand where this movie's being projected from, which is from other um, frequency bands of reality through the Illuminati families and the Illuminati structure within visible light human society to, to, to become the movie we call human society, then you can go back to the point it's coming from and therefore you can change what's coming. You can change the movie. And that's what we need to do. And to do that, you know, those that... And I'm not knocking the five cents level of the conspiracy and communicating it, 9-11, manipulate, I'm doing it every day on my website. The books are full of it. We need to know that. But if we only do that, then basically we are seeing the outcome. We are not seeing the origin. And you cannot change an outcome without changing the origin. And so um, what we... Uh, when I look at so much uh, conspiracy research, good luck to them. You know, everybody that comes and does this, hallelujah to you. Good, good on you. But there comes a point where we, we, we know 
how the system works in the holographic world. I mean, what's left? Finding out what size shoes Henry Kissinger takes. Yes, on a daily basis as it unfolds, we need to, you know, keep with it. But, okay. But, are we going to become recorders of our own enslavement? Oh, see, I told you they'd do this next. Look, they're doing it. If we do that, we've moved from not knowing that the prison's being built around us to seeing the prison being built around us. But there's a common theme between the two of them. The prison's being built around us. And that's fine if people want to do that only. I'm not saying don't do it, but, but to do it only and ignore where it's coming from, therefore the solution or the removing the cause of the problem. We, the, the people who only do that, will record and record and record and record their own gathering enslavement and the enslavement of humanity until we wake up. Shh. Would you come with me, sir? I, I, I ain't waiting for that. I want, I, I, we need to change where it's coming from. And for that, there are some major challenges for those in the conspiracy research arena who are dominated by a sense of patriotism and dominated by a sense of a religion. Because patriotism in the sense of, I'm not saying don't, you know, love your country and love your culture, not, nothing like that, but patriotism in the sense of self-identity, I am an American, I am an American patriot, no! That is your experience. What you are is infinite awareness. All that is, has been and ever can be, all possibility, having that experience. And I'm a Christian. No, you're not. That's the belief system you have chosen to take on as your persona. But it's an experience of being a Christian. It is not who you are. And if you self-identify with being a Christian or being a, a, a Jew or being a Muslim or being a Hindu... Again, you are in a self-identity which is self-identifying with something that's not you. And also, and this is in terms of getting to the origin, it means that you are not going to go, I've come across this all the time, me. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm the guy that, that, that people in mainstream society, they see conspiracy researchers of the five sense nature as extreme and crazy a lot of them see me as <laughs> extreme and crazy because the if you think that all you need to know about life and reality is between the covers of two uh, uh, two covers of a book written by who knows who who knows when and who knows what circumstances the quran and the bible and the, all the rest of it then and, 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 and what that, re that tells you you are and reality is and how it all works, you ain't even going to begin to go down the rabbit hole into the areas that we need to understand. Because if you do, you immediately realise that your religion is part of the conspiracy. We talked earlier about the archons and this demiurge that the uh, this like devil figure as Christians would call it um, uh, to um, that uh, the, the Gnostics talked about in their texts well that demiurge and those archons those jinn and whatever you want to call it those reptilians and all the different facets they are the force that the major religions worship as God. Yeah. It is the Islamic God. 
which is the Christian God. Oh, I'm being controversial now, aren't I? <laughs> I have been known to. I don't care. I want the truth, not popularity contest victory. <laughs> it's the God of, the, of Islam. It's the God of uh, Christianity. It's the God of Judaism. Yahweh. Oh, that's, that's, that's the demiurge. That's this fake um, creator. Creator, not creator. Manipulator of creation that the, the um, Gnostics talked about. So... We got this situation. Please tell me it's not true. I'm afraid it is. But it doesn't have to be. We just change it. And it's gone. But where this unseen network uh, that the Gnostics talked about, all these people talk about, have created this um, conspiracy, this network of human manipulation of politics and business and banking and all the rest of it. And some people, increasingly large numbers of people, fantastic, have started to see that and challenge it and, and try to expose it. But at the same time, they are welded to religions that are worshipping the very force that created what they're trying to expose. And I suggest what we need is, yes, to move here, to open this and let consciousness in, but we also need a blank sheet of paper. A blank sheet of paper that says, okay, all preconceived ideas over here, all preconceived beliefs and perceptions of reality over here. Now, from this point, what goes on that sheet of paper in terms of my perception of reality comes from information, comes from innate knowing, does it feel right, um, and comes from it standing up on the basis of credible information and intuitive knowing. Now, some of these preconceived beliefs, they might be able to be put back. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't think many will. <laughs> I don't think any will, really, but, but they can be. But they're not there on the sheet of paper dictating reality by reflex action. Now, David, I, he talks about shape-shifting reptilians. He's mad. It's not possible. Um, no, you do not believe it's possible, and thus you are dismissing what is absolutely explainable, not because you've researched it, not because you've even looked at it, but because that program, which is dictating your sense of reality, cannot encompass it. Thus, people say to me, and have said to many people in this arena, when the actions of these families have been exposed, um, they'd never do that. No, mate, you would never do that. They would and are every day. It's this... Uh, and then you say, well, how much... I've said this to television interviews in the mainstream, but they're like, no, she's rubbish, she's like... And I said, well, I've been to 55 countries, many of them many times. I've researched this full time for 22 years. How much research have you done on this subject? Zilch. But it's different. It's outside of their perception of possibility. So it's dismissed. And this blank sheet of paper lets anything in so long as it justifies its place on the paper. And, and when, when you do that with an open mind, you don't say, I'm a Christian, so I don't criticize Christianity. You go, I'm going to look at Christianity and what I've believed up to this point with a, from a, pers a, a detached perspective and see if it stands up. I know a guy in America who set out many decades now. He was a, he was a, a real avid Christian. And he set out to prove the Christian story was true. Jesus existed and all this stuff. And very soon after this, 
as he started, I'm going to show it. Of course, what he realised very quickly is the evidence is all the other way, and he became a conspiracy researcher. Because then he's going, well, nothing of it. If if I've been duped on this, what else am I being duped on? And then, and then the, the you know the the, the, the dominoes start to fall, and you start to see the, the greater conspiracy. Uh, but he he, he 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 had an open mind enough to see that when the information was going in a certain direction, he was willing to go with it. But a lot of people that are welded to religions, they don't want to look at the information. And, and you know, you can be a religious believer, and you can you can go to the five sense level of the conspiracy because you can say it's it's Satan uh, uh, and, and and Jesus is coming and it's Armageddon and it's the end times and all that stuff. You can do all that from a Christian perspective, but you ain't going to get in the rabbit hole. To do that, all those belief systems have to go because they're there to censor the true self. Okay, thank you, David. That's um, amazing and uh, a lot of information and um, a lot to think about. But the important thing is not to think, but to know, to feel, and and we ha we all have the ability and the um, what humans have, we can change it because we can create which the others can't. Yeah, so they create through us. And the differences and the, the way to turn this around is to, instead of having our sense of reality manifest as our experienced reality by external forces manipulating our sense of reality, which becomes our experienced reality, we get rid of that influence and our unique perception of reality becomes our unique experience of reality. Do you and think we've got a world lo worth living in then. Uh, yeah. Do you think 2012 is a year that a lot of people say then there will be a major change? Do you think that's happening? Well, I, I've not gone along with that um, in, in the way that it's just been described in many ways. Um, I came across a, a theme almost immediately after my initial stirring awake in 1990, in the spring, when I went to a psychic uh, because a pre I felt this presence around me all the time and I wanted to know what it was. I didn't tell her, but uh, just to see if she would pick it up and bingo, lots of things happened. So, you know, I was going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets and then there's a shadow across the world had to be lifted as well. I'd be told all that stuff. From that very earliest time, there was this theme that there was a vibrational change, which I would see now as a waveform information change, um, that was going to um, have two, many, many effects, but two major ones. One, it would awaken vast, vast numbers of people eventually um, to another uh, perception of self in the world and reality. That the 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 the, the, the less closed-minded would be affected first, but eventually people at that time who were absolutely in the bubble in the box would be affected. Well, it's happening quite demonstrably. It's happening, and the other effect, major effect that, uh, uh, of this vibrational change, which way back in 1990 I gave the title "The Truth Vibrations" because mm. of this. Um, these changes that we was going to bring was going to be that this vibrational change would bring to the surface all that had been hidden so people could see it. Well, you look about people waking up to another version of reality and self and the world in vast numbers in 1990. You look at um, uh, all that's been hidden coming to the surface in 1990. Yeah. What? Look at it in 2012. It's incredible. It's yeah. happening, yeah. right? But this truth vibrations that I was, as I called it, uh, was going to be something that would get more and more powerful and more and more influential. And the significance, a greater significance for me of 2012 is that it's not 2011, hmm. but it's not 2013 either. However, I think that what we are seeing in 2012 um, 
and we'll see more of in 2013, 14, 15, mm. is that we are now reaching um, a point in this where it's starting to, to be tangible in its impact. You know, I'm seeing people now within the system, doctors, scientists, people like that, are starting to look and say, it's all nonsense, isn't it, right? Now this is, so we've reached a point in 2012 where this is becoming more and more tangible. Um, and I think by the end of the year, it will be more tangible, mm. you know, because mm. this is an ongoing thing. Um, and, and, and the focus on 2012 in a positive way about, you know, this is going to be the Great Awakening. And I don't think it's going to be the Great Awakening in one year, but that focus on it, um, people are focusing on the fact of, the, of awakening, and that's got bound to impact upon people opening their minds. The negative part about it, of course, is this stuff about the end of the world and all that stuff, which brings, where, where does that take you? It takes you here. So I think that um, 2012 is significant in that way, but in 2013, we're going to see the impact even greater, 2014 even greater. And there's going to come a point where this uh, information vibrational change is going to reach a tipping point where it's the dominating perception. Uh, and at that point, the House of Cards will come down. And one of the uh, other themes in the last 22 years that I've picked up from many different sources and stuff is that just when the control system appears to hold all the aces <laughs> and has got everything in place, mm. it's going to come down so fast it's going to be shocking. Um, so uh, for a little while longer, this is this. I mean, we're seeing it now. You know, President of the United States every day deciding which who's, who's going to be killed in yeah. a drone drone attack and all that stuff without any due process or anything. That so we're moving, but. Um, at the same time, this awakening is moving as well. And, you know, the president um, and the control system and their agenda and their um, unfolding uh, Orwellian state, although it's not called that, the facets of it as they unfold are all over the television news and they're in all the newspapers. Mm. So people can get the impression understandably, that that's, that's, that's all going on. Oh, my goodness me, look, look at this. What's not in the papers, what's not on the television, for obvious bloody reasons, is that this is this quiet, well, in terms of people like me, as loud as I can bloody be, um, awakening, but a quiet awakening with most people hmm. is, is, is gathering and it's growing. And um, it will eventually um, be like a tidal wave of change and bring an end to this bloody nonsense because the power that is used to enslave and manipulate us is merely the power we give away every day. When we stop doing that, there's a very high, loud bang and the house of cards comes down. But um, so that's the revolution. The revolution is not stockpiling weapons and hurling abuse and all this stuff. It, the revolution is um, remembering who we really are and the power to dictate our own reality collectively and individually that that memory brings. That's the revolution, remembering who we are. That's why I call this big event at Wembley, remember who you are. It's the key to everything. If we don't remember who we truly are, infinite consciousness having an experience, Nothing's going to change, and uh, but we are, and so it is. That's changing. We can see it, and you're part of it, and we are part of it. And I thank you for what you do. Well, thanks, and anyone can be part of it. It's yeah. just a choice. Right. Thank you, David. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thanks a lot.